Bigorni Tai Kije, Shirazan Yilamadva Kije, Gol Premanandi Haripo Haripo. So today we're going to say a few words about Srila Prabhupada, our beloved spiritual master, the founder of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. He's the founder Anacharya, meaning he is for us the most important authority for practicing Krishna Consciousness. He spent many years distilling to the essence the instructions of the previous acharyas and he has presented them in all of his books and purports therefore we were fortunate because he's made it very easy for us to assimilate krishna consciousness and uh, often he said uh, you don't even have to know Sanskrit. You simply read my books and you'll have all understanding. you have complete understanding of Krishna consciousness. So I want to uh, uh, go over some things that Prabhupada has said that are very important, uh, in, uh, especially in his letters to his disciples in the early years, the 1960s and and then the late 1960s and then the 1970s, where he was establishing uh, the Krishna consciousness movement, and he had to answer many questions that the disciples had at that time. They were all new to this. And uh, he wrote extensively in his letters and in his books, explanation of Krishna consciousness. And he made it very simple and easy to understand so, in a letter that he wrote to a young uh, the, uh, female disciple, Shama Dasi, in 1968, September 11, 1968. And he says to her, In the Vedas, it is stated that simply by understanding Krishna, one understands everything. This means that there are two departmental education, educational policies. One departmental education is spiritual education, and the other departmental educational system is material education. One who is highly elevated in material education cannot understand about anything spiritual. But one who is elevated highly in a spiritual education can understand anything material. In other words, all material things are dependent on the spiritual soul. Just like your body, my body, this material body. They have developed on the basis of the spirit soul. Therefore, Krishna, being the supreme spirit, one who tries to understand Krishna, he can understand everything else. From your statement of the letter under reply, I can understand that by the grace of Krishna, you are improving in Krishna consciousness. And if you continue to keep up your attitude in this spirit, surely in this very life, you will be successful to reach the perfectional stages. It is my duty to open your eyes. Because a spiritual master is he who can save his disciples from the darkness of nations, illusion. So I am trying my best to do my duty. And if you cooperate with me fully, certainly both you, both yourself and myself will be successful in our missionary work and so this is the essence of the whole spiritual life. One needs to contact a bona fide spiritual master who can give authentic bona fide knowledge of Krishna. And if you understand Krishna, you understand everything. You don't really need material education. What you really need is spiritual education. And then you'll be able to understand 
this material world, world correctly. What does that mean? It means the following. If you only have material education, you will not understand what is the goal of life. You'll be, the goal of life will be misrepresented as material prosperity and sense gratification. And then you will waste your whole life pursuing material prosperity and sense gratification. But if you have spiritual education, then you'll learn how to use the material energy in the service of Krishna. Therefore, you will not be in any way misled uh, concerning what is the goal of life. So this is the tragedy today. Everyone is emphasizing material education, and the result of it is that they eventually ignore Krishna and simply pursue making money and using it for sense gratification. But if you get first your spiritual education, and that includes understanding how to relate to the material world correctly, how do you do? How should you relate to the material world? You should understand it's the energy of Krishna. He has two big categories of energies. They are para prakriti and apara prakriti. The para prakriti is the superior spiritual energy. And the aparaprakriti is the inferior material energy. But both are Krishna's energies. Both are eternal. And both should only be used in the service of Krishna. Then you have correct understanding of matter, of material, of the material world. And you'll not be misled. You use something material in the service of Krishna, it manifests its spiritual uh, let's say, potency. If you use the same thing, not for Krishna, but for sense gratification, you become a victim of the laws of material nature, of birth, death, old age, and disease. And you will be bewildered your whole life, chasing after the phantom of sense gratification, material opulence, prestige, uh, bodily identification, and uh, and basically uh, being a victim of lust, anger, and greed. Now, this basic fundamental point is explained in the fourth chapter, 24th verse, Bhagavad Gita. Brahmarpanam brahmahavir, brahmaragno brahmanahutam, brahmae vatena gantavya brahmakarma samadina. A person, uh, Krishna says, a person who is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness is sure to attain the spiritual kingdom because of his full contribution to spiritual activities in which the consumption is absolute and that which is offered is of the same spiritual nature. Now, for many years, I read this verse and I didn't understand what it meant, even though I read the purport also. Of course, the verse is explained in the purport. But then, as I became a little more, let's say, uh, advanced in, in hearing and chanting and controlling my senses, the, the meaning of this verse and its purport uh, became like the rising sun in the morning. It just illuminated my mind to understand what is Krishna consciousness. Now I'm going to read the essential part of this purport and explain what it actually means. In the purport, Prabhupada says, the Lord is spiritual and the rays of his transcendental body are called Brahma Jyoti. His spiritual effulgence, everything that exists is situated in that Brahma Jyoti his spiritual effulgence. But when the jyoti, meaning the, the spiritual light, is covered by illusion, which is maya or sense gratification, it is called material. This material veil can be removed. At, now, why does he say this? Because material education teaches you to be illusioned. Why? Because it teaches you to fall under the influence of maya. What is maya? Maya means 
the purpose of my life is to gain as much sense gratification as possible. That is eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. That is every one of those four things is sense gratification because one wants to defend themselves to have more sense gratification without interruption in their house or in their country. One uh, eats in order to have strength to have sense gratification. One sleeps in order to have more power for sense gratification. And then one mates, and that is the sense gratif the ultimate sense gratification that they want. So you see, material education will mislead a person and convince them to fall under the influence of maya. And what is the influence of maya? Eating, sleeping, mating, and defending only to uh, protect and increase your own sense gratification or the sense gratification of your ethnic group or the sense gratification of your racial group or the sense gratification of your national group or sense gratification of your universal group. But the, the goal is always sense gratification. So this material veil, that is when the jyoti, the, the light of spiritual light of Krishna consciousness is covered by illusion or maya or sense gratification, it is called material. This material veil can be removed at once by Krishna consciousness. Thus the offering for the sake of Krishna consciousness, the consuming agent of such an offering or contribution, the process of consumption, the contributor, and the result are all combined together, Brahman or the absolute truth. In other words, when it says, the veil can be removed at once by Krishna consciousness, that is, learning how to offer food to Krishna and, and what Krishna wants to eat, not just anything, and then praying sincerely, please accept this offering, my dear Lord, and then giving the Lord time to respect the prasadam, and then if you've done this sincerely, he offers it back as his prasadam, his mercy, and by partaking of that mercy, your body and mind and senses become purified. And with purified body, mind, and senses, you're able to understand Krishna consciousness. As long as the body, mind, and senses are impure due to sense gratification, no matter how hard you try, you will not understand. Because understanding of spiritual knowledge is is coming from Krishna as the Paramatma in the heart, and he reveals knowledge to us. Knowledge is not really academic. It's revealed to us by how much we surrender to the Lord. So it says here that this material veil can be removed at once by Krishna consciousness, and Krishna consciousness is a process of offering everything, your life, your energy, your thoughts, your uh, money, your uh, material assets, your, your family, everything to Krishna. And then Krishna purifies all these things and offers it back to you as his mercy. Thus the offering for the sake of Krishna consciousness, okay, whatever you're offering, the consuming agent of such an offering or contribution, well, the first consuming agent is Krishna. And then he offers the food or whatever you're offered to him that he is acceptable. He offers it back as his prashadam or as his mercy. So we are the second, uh, let's say, um, consuming agent. Krishna is the first, and if it's done properly, he offers it back, and we become the second consuming agent. And then it says, uh, the consuming agent of such an offering or contribution, the process of consumption. Well, the process of consumption is offering to Krishna with prayers that uh, basically uh, say, when you, first you, you offer the spiritual master, and then the spiritual master offers it to his spiritual master, and it goes all the way up through the, 
disciplic succession to the original spiritual master, Krishna. And so we're making an offering, going through the entire parampara, and then Krishna blesses the offering by accepting it, and then he offers it back again through the parampara, right down to the initiating uh, guru and, and shiksu guru, and then he gives back through this chain uh, his mercy to the devotee. So this is a reciprocal process because there's love and devotion. Love and devotion means there's the devotee or the lover and there is the beloved Krishna and there's a reciprocal relationship between them. So uh, the, the, the consuming agent of such an offering or contribution, the process of consumption, which is what I just explained, the contributor and the result, the contributor, that is, we are the contributor, and the result are all combined together, Brahman or the absolute truth. Yes, because you can, by connecting to Krishna, this is called yukta, uh, yoga yukta, we connect to Krishna through devotional service, then this reciprocal uh, relationship takes place. We're making offerings, and Krishna, if he accepts them, he, he offers back his mercy. And this is called the process of Krishna consciousness. Then Prabhupada says, and it all becomes absolute truth. The absolute truth covered by maya is called matter. Matter, dovetailed for the cause of the absolute truth, regains its spiritual quality. Krishna consciousness is the process of converting the illusory consciousness into Brahman or the Supreme. So the illusory consciousness is what we're suffering from now. We think, I am this body. We think the goal of life is to pleasure this body, this material body, through different forms of sense gratification. There's gross forms, eating, sleeping, mating, defending, and then subtle forms of mental uh, preoccupation, thinking about sense gratification, planning for sense gratification, and then becoming determined to engage in sex, sense gratification. This thinking, feeling, and willing is a mental activity that precedes activity, real activity, in the material world. So either it's mentally performed or physically performed. Both entangle us in, this, in the cycle of birth and death. So our body has to be purified and our mind has to be purified, and our intelligence has to be purified, then we are able to understand Krishna. As long as sense gratification is our main goal in life, everything, the intelligence, the mind, the senses, the body becomes contaminated. So Krishna consciousness is the process of converting the illusory consciousness into Brahman or the Supreme. When the mind is fully absorbed in Krishna consciousness, it's said to be in samadhi or trance. Anything done in such transcendental consciousness is called yagya or sacrifice for the absolute. In that condition of spiritual consciousness, the contributor, the contribution, the consumption, the performer or the leader of the performance and the result or ultimate gain, everything becomes one in the absolute, the supreme Brahman, that is the method of Krishna consciousness. So we are learning from Srila Prabhupada how to transform the material energy back to its original form of, of, of being spiritual. Material energy is also spiritual, but when we use it for sense gratification, it appears material. And when we use the same thing in Krishna's ser service, it becomes spiritual. Okay, so that's a quick explanation of Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada explains here, it is my duty to open your eyes. That's, that's what a spiritual master is supposed to do. Because a spiritual master is he who can save his disciples from the darkness of nations or ignorance or illusion. What is that darkness? Again, it's thinking that life is meant for sense gratification. So I am trying my best to do my duty. And if you cooperate with me fully, certainly you, 
both yourself and myself will be successful in our missionary work. So that was a very important instruction Prabhupada gave to Shamadasi. Another important instruction that Prabhupada gave is uh, two things. One, he's, he explains in a letter to Satsvarut Prabhu in 20th September 1968, he says, our relationship is eternal, meaning the relationship of the guru and the disciple is eternal. But if somebody lags behind, so in spite of our eternal relationship, one may not meet the other at the destination, meaning back to Godhead. Just like a flock of birds, although very intimately related, every one of them has to fly in the sky by individual strength. If one is less strong and the other cannot keep him in the sky, that is the law of nature. So long every one of us is strong in Krishna consciousness, there is no doubt you can fly in the spiritual sky and, meet, and we will meet together without failure. Therefore, individual strength is most important, and that individual strength is achieved by the association of devotees also. So you can make your own judgment. Now, this is a very important statement by Prabhupada. Basically, it's saying it's up to us. If we want to go back to Godhead and always be in the association of Prabhupada and transcendental devotees, and Krishna especially, then we have to build up our spiritual strength so we have the stamina and the wherewithal to stay in the flock of birds flying back to Godhead. It's all based on individual strength, spiritual strength. And how do we, we develop such spiritual strength? It's by following sadhana bhakti, hearing and chanting regularly and uh, chanting our 16 rounds minimum regularly and eating only prasadam and regularly attending the classes of Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam and engaging in devotional service in the association of devotees in the temple and, and in other ways, always staying in that good association and learning from our superiors, superior devotees, how to be, how to use the entire material energy in the service of Krishna. If we do this, then our eternal relationship uh, with the spiritual master will take us back. Will, will take us back to Godhead. Then another important instruction he gave to Satsvaru Maharaj in 1968 was the following. He said, "Married life is not for sex indulgence." The principle of marriage is on the background of getting good children. So the householder is allowed to have sex life once a month, just after the menstrual period. The menstrual period belongs at least for five days. So after this five days, one can have sex life, provided he desires to get a child. And as soon as the wife is pregnant, no more sex life, until the child is born and is grown up at least for six months. After that, one may have sex life on the same principle. If one does not want more than one or two children, he should voluntarily stop sex life. But one should not strictly use any contraceptive method and at the same time indulge in sex life. That is very much sinful. If the husband and wife can voluntarily restrain by powerful advancement in Krishna consciousness, that is the best method. It is not necessary that because one has got a wife, therefore you must have sex life. The whole scheme is to avoid sex life as far as possible. And if one can avoid it completely, then it is a great victory for him or her. Married life is a sort of license for sex life on condition of raising children. So you should try to understand these principles of married life and use your discretion. You should not imitate great personalities like Bhaktivinoda Thakur who had uh, at least 13 children. But you must follow in his footstep or his footprints. But it is not always possible to have the same success as great personalities like Bhaktivinoda Thakur achieved. Yeah, every one of his children 
became a pure devotee. <clears throat> so, in all circumstances, you should try to follow the footprints of authorities, but never to imitate them. Unless your wife develops a better health and strength, I do not advise her to become pregnant. I think you will understand the instruction as I have given and try to follow it as far as possible. Okay, so those were two big, very important instructions that Prabhupada gave to his disciples so that they could have success in spiritual life. And now, in another letter to a devotee named Devananda, Prabhupada explains the secret of success. And he says, But one thing I may inform you, that the three books which I have already prepared, this is in 1968, namely the Bhagavad Gita as it is, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya, and Srimad Bhagavatam, all these books are the ultimate source of knowledge. If you simply reproduce what I have tried to explain in these books, meaning simply repeat what I've given in these books. Surely you will come out victorious, even in the midst of so many great mundane scholars. In other words, even though a devotee may not have a PhD, may not be a scholar, may not be highly educated in material knowledge, if, he's, if the devotee simply repeats what Prabhupada has given in his books, in these three books, Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, and Ch uh, Teachings of Lord Chaitanya, then the devotee will be victorious even amongst many great mundane scholars. The description given in these books are not mundane speculations, but they are authorized versions of liberated souls. In other words, Prabhupada saying, it's not just my opinion. My opinion is not expressed. I'm simply repeating what the great acharyas in the disciplic succession, starting from Krishna to Narada to Vyasa and so forth, down to, to Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Gorkhisura Babaji and Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasri Thakur and, and now Srila Prabhupada. This is what Prabhupada is presenting. He said, he says, but they are the authorized versions, that is Prabhupada's books and purports, of liberated souls presented by our humble self. So the strength is not in us, but the strength is in the Supreme Lord. And we have simply to present, and we have simply to present them without any adulteration in humble spirit, service spirit. That is the secret of success. So this is an extremely important instruction that Prabhupada gives. If we want to be successful in our uh, Krishna consciousness and, and presenting Krishna consciousness to others or preaching it to others, this is what we have to do. The strength is not in us. We should not be puffed up that, oh, I know so many verses or I know so many different philosophical explanations. I read this book, I read that book and this other book. No, simply need these three books, and especially Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam and, and uh, the Chaitanya Charitamrita or the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. And we can be completely successful in our presentation by simply repeating what's in these books, not deviating from, deviating from it. That's why he says, simply to present them without any adulteration, any amount of speculation or, uh, let's say, uh, alteration, changing or eliminating or uh, uh, negating something in, in his books would be an adulteration. And in humble service spirit. Yes, a devotee must always be humble. Humble means I, you are Prabhu, I am Das. Not that I am Prabhu and you are Das. 
we should always think of ourselves as the servant of the servant of the servant ad infinitum of the gopis of Vrindavan who are serving Krishna. So in a humble service spirit, he says, that is the secret of success. Okay, so another important instruction that Prabhupada gave, monumental instruction. A devotee named Tosan Krishna, who I know personally, and he's still a devotee today, uh, received a letter from Prabhupada, who at that time was in Seattle, October 7th, 1968, and he writes, regarding your proposal to become a doctor, and by the way, Toshan Krishna never became a doctor, right? because your mother wants to pros uh, prosecute your ex education, in other words, to manage his education, I think if you can learn Krishna consciousness perfectly, by reading our different literatures and books, meaning Bhagavad Gita, Srimad Bhagavatam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, you will be a better doctor than the ordinary physician. The ordinary physician may cure the disease of the body, but if you become advanced in Krishna consciousness, you will be able to cure the disease of the soul for many, many persons. And that is more important than a doctor or medical practitioner for curing the disease of this body. However, we may be expert for keeping this body fit. It is sure and certain that this will end. In other words, the body is going to end no matter what strategy, what medicine, what nanotechnology, what uh, uh, idea or concept or new uh, medicine or new cure uh, will promise? You're still going to die. <clears throat> Prabhupada says, the ordinary physician may cure the disease of the body, but if you become advanced in Krishna consciousness, you'll be able to cure the disease of the soul for many, many persons. And that is more important than a doctor or medical practitioner for curing the disease of this body. However, we may be expert for keeping this body fit. It is sure and certain that it will come to an end. But if you can protect the soul from being fallen a victim of this material existence, that is a great service. In some of the Vedic literatures, it is said that Atmanam sarvato rakshet. That means one should give first protection to the soul. Then he should take care of his particular type of faith. Then he should take care of the material things, namely his body and anything in relation with his body or wealth. So that is the priority. Prabhupada has prioritized now what should be the most important uh, things in our life. So first, he uses this Vedic statement, Atmanam Sarvatu Rakshet, which means one should give first protection to the soul. Then he should take care of his particular type of faith. Then he should take care of the material things, namely his body, and anything in relation with this body or wealth. Please try to read all our books very carefully. And whenever there is any doubt, you ask me and be expert preacher. That will make you a great doctor for protecting the human society from be being fallen a victim to Maya illusion. I hope this will meet you in good health. So this is a monumental instruction Prabhupada gave in 1968 to his disciple, Tosan Krishna, who did not go forward to become a doctor of the body, but he became doctor of the soul. And he followed Prabhupada's instruction. And that's why he's still a devotee and he's still preaching Krishna consciousness. Okay, so first priority, take care of the soul. And then faith. Now, how do you take care of faith? That's an important statement Prabhupada makes. This is also explained in 
the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, I think. Let me see where that is. Yes. The Prabhupada says, uh, Krishna says, Shadaval Abhate Yanam Tatpara Samyatendriya Brahmanam Ladva Param Santim Achiren Adigachati. This is the fourth chapter, 38th verse, uh, 39th verse, I'm sorry, 439. And Prabhupada says, A faithful man who is dedicated to transcendental knowledge and who subdues his senses, is eligible to achieve such knowledge. And having achieved it, he quickly attains the supreme spiritual peace. Now, this again is an extremely important verse and explaining Prabhupada's statement to uh, Toshan Krishna in 1978. He says, first and foremost, uh, he says, Atmanam Sarvato Rakshad. One should give first protection to the soul. And then, second preoccupation should be protect faith. Now, how do you protect your faith? Well, Prabhupada explains that this transcendental knowledge, meaning Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, in Krishna consciousness can be achieved by a faithful person who believes firmly in Krishna. So everybody has faith. Faith always precedes knowledge. For example, when you buy a ticket on an airplane, let's say it's Air India, to go to Bombay, do you know that the airplane is going to land safely in Bombay? Do you know? No, you don't know. But you have faith that it will. Now, if when you buy the ticket, the ticket salesperson tells you, sir, excuse me, this is a confidential thing I want to tell you. Don't go on this airplane. It's going to crash. Would you buy the ticket? No, you wouldn't, but because that person destroyed your faith that the plane is going to arrive safely. You see? So faith always precedes knowledge. So you get on the plane and you have faith that the uh, airline pilot is not a drunkard and uh, an irresponsible person. And secondly, you have faith that the airplane is in good mechanical functioning state, right? If, if on the, uh, when the engine starts, if it fails and catches on fire, right, you would immediately get off the airplane. You don't want it to happen while you're flying in the air. So you have this faith in the airplane and the maintenance of it, and you have this faith in the pilots. And then you get on the plane. If your faith is in any way shaken, you will not get on that plane even if they pay you to get on the plane. Right? And still, while you're in the air, you're not sure it's going to land safely. You still have faith that it will. And when it does land safely, many times I've been on long international flights, when the plane lands safely in Mumbai, everyone claps. <laughs> and they, they have great sense of relief. Way we got here, you know, without crashing in the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> okay, so faith precedes. So therefore, first, you must protect the soul. And secondly, you have to protect your faith, Prabhupada says. And third, you have, you have to deal with material things. Right? It's not, that's the priority of a devotee. It's prioritized by the acharyas. And if you prioritize according to mundane knowledge, first is the body. Then it's the family. Then it's the nation. And then way down on the priority uh, list, there's something about faith in God and so forth. But first is the body, the family. And that's why all these politicians, they always say, the most important thing for me is family. That's after they got caught having illicit connections, right? The most important thing is the family. Well, and that's the bottom line of most people in life. 
But actually, the most important thing is the soul. And the second most important thing is the faith that we have in Krishna or God. So here it says, such knowledge in Krishna consciousness, meaning transcendental knowledge achieved by a faithful person, can be achieved by a faithful person who believes firmly in Krishna. One is called a faithful man who thinks that simply by acting in Krishna consciousness, he can attain the highest perfection. No, it's not simply by getting my PhD or simply by becoming a billionaire through the stock market or, or, or through this business venture or patenting this thing or patenting that thing or becoming a scientist or becoming a politician or becoming a dictator or whatever. No, it's simply by acting in Krishna consciousness. That means waking up early every day, taking a shower, putting on clean devotee clothing, coming to Mangala Arti, chanting your rounds, uh, witnessing the, the Arti, and uh, hearing the, the lectures, Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam, and worshiping Tulsi Devi, worshiping the Guru, Srila Prabhupada, and, and uh, in this way, you know, taking prasadam and then going out on sankirtan, distributing books and preaching and being engaged 24 hours a day in one way or another in Krishna consciousness. But someone said, well, wait a minute, I have to have a job. I have to take care of my family. That's fine. As long as you use everything material in the service of Krishna, as we already discussed, Brahmartanam, Brahma, Havir, Brahmartno, Brahmana, Hutam, Brahmaiva, Tainat, Ganta, Vya, Brahma, Karma. Uh, so this, this using everything in Krishna's service, that has to be learned from spiritual masters, Siksha and Diksha gurus. So this is this faith. <clears throat> that simply by acting in Krishna consciousness, one can attain the highest perfection. This faith is attained by discharge of devotional service and by chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare, which cleanses one's heart of all material dirt. Over and above this, one should control the senses. A person who's faithful to Krishna and who controls the senses can easily attain perfection in the knowledge of Krishna consciousness without delay. This is Prabhupada's instruction. This is Krishna's instruction. This is explaining how to be successful in life. So he's writing to Toshan Krishna. He says, Atmanam Sarvato Drakshet. That means one should give first protection to the soul. Now, how do you do that? by always remaining in Krishna consciousness in every situation of your life, in the association of devotees and engaging in devotional service and using all your assets, your mental, intellectual assets, the assets of your material body for rendering service and your material assets such as money and property and so forth in the service of the Lord. Then you should take care of his particular type of faith. Without faith, in Krishna and Prabhupada and Krishna consciousness, you will not stay in Krishna consciousness. So you have to culture that faith, like you, like you take care of a plant or you take care of your car or you take care of your teeth or you take care of your feet. You have to culture uh, your faith. And what does it mean to culture your faith? It means how you do things. You should always remain in the association of devotees, good devotees, and always seek service and engage in that service and always follow the regulative principles. So Prabhupada says, then he should take care of his particular type of faith. Then he should take care of the material things, namely his body and anything in relation with his body or wealth. Please try to read all, my, all our books very carefully. And whenever there's any doubt, you ask me, Prabhupada says. Well, how do we ask Prabhupada? We ask Prabhupada by asking his uh, sincere devotees who will show you the answer to your question Prabhupada and Krishna have given in Bhagavad Gita and Srimad Bhagavatam. That's how you ask Prabhupada. 
You might say, well, oh, Prabhupada's not here now. How can I ask him? Well, I'll just become a karmi then. No, Prabhupada is here because his books are here. His letters are here that I'm reading from now. His uh, tapes, of his lectures are here. And his devotees are here. And they will show you. How, how does a devotee answer a question? Answer your question. He shows you where you're, the answer is given by Prabhupada and the acharyas in the books. That's how, he, uh, that's how he answers. He doesn't say, well, I think maybe you can do this. You know, If you do some Reiki, it'll help you. That's a bunch of nonsense. Okay? It's not Reiki. It's not this. It's not that. It's Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Gita. And it's chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Okay, so now I'm going to go to another very, very important point. And that is a letter Prabhupada wrote to, one second. He says, he says, regarding your questions, a letter he wrote in 1976 to uh, Madhava Das. He says, regarding your question, matter originally is spirit. And when spirit is not distinctly understood, that is matter. Just like a tree is also a manifestation of spirit soul, meaning there's a living entity in the tree. It's, it has an eternal soul. But the consciousness is covered. When the tree is cut, is that it does not protest. But the moving entity has stronger consciousness than the tree. There is consciousness in the tree, though. There's also consciousness in the tree. Also, consciousness in a dormant state is matter. Consciousness in a completely developed state is spirit. Matter is the symbol of undeveloped consciousness. Now, this is amazing statements here. Everything depends on consciousness. Even, like for example, the uh, scientists say, well, we've only discovered 1.2 million species. Well, we don't understand what your guru is saying, that in the Vedas there are 8,400,000 species. Like for example, they take all human beings as one species but not the Vedas. Vedas do not discriminate a species based on a body type. Did you know that? You learned something new today. The Vedas do not distinguish or discriminate or distinguish species based on a body type. They, dis they define a species according to the consciousness this is an extremely important point. That's why he says that when one is not, uh, though has not, very little developed consciousness, that is matter. You see? And a tree also has, has more consciousness than just dull matter because it is made out of matter, but it's a living entity. But it doesn't protest when you cut it down. Whereas someone who's highly conscious or Krishna conscious, uh, and so in, in this case of the, uh, of, uh, the tree and this double matter, the consciousness is mostly dormant. However, in highly developed state of consciousness, one is completely Krishna conscious. In other words, they see the relationship of everything with Krishna, and therefore they use everything correctly in the service of Krishna. That's highly developed consciousness, you see. So, uh, then, so matter and spirit is explained here. Matter originally is spirit, and when spirit is not distinctly understood, that is matter. Just like a tree is also a manifestation of spirit soul, but the consciousness is covered. When the tree is cut, it does not protest. So if you were asked 
to stand in one place like a tree. After a few hours, you would protest. So I can't stay like this. I got to go to the bathroom and I have this telephone call. It's very important. I have to take it. And, and uh, how am I going to earn money if I just stand here like a tree? So you would protest right away. You know, I'm not going to stand here like a tree in the wintertime. It's freezing cold. And I'm not going to stand here like a tree in the summertime. It's too hot. Right? So you would be protesting all the time. You'd be out in downtown Seattle burning down the federal building, protesting, right? dissatisfied. But the tree doesn't protest at all because it has very low consciousness. Okay. Thinking in subtle form, Prabhupada says, thinking is a subtle form of matter. Have you ever heard that before? Thinking is a subtle form of matter. Just like it says in Bhagavad Gita, Bhumir Apo Nalo Vayu. He says, my separated inferior spiritual energy is earth, water, fire, air, etc. Mind, intelligence, and so forth. Like the ether is subtle, the mind is more subtle. Subtle form of matter. So if we live on the level of the mind, like philosophers like uh, René Descartes and Jean and John Locke and, and Immanuel Kant, they were all living on the mental platform. But it's it's subtle. It's subtle. But it's not, it's, but it's still material. Therefore, they got everything wrong, or most of what they speculated was wrong. So we have to go above the mental level to the intellectual level and above the intellectual level to the soul. Then we get everything right. But as long as we're on these subtle material levels, like intellect, mind, senses, and body, we will never get things right. We'll always get it wrong. Okay. So, there's another important thing. Prabhupada wrote a letter to Jawaharlal Nehru. And we're going to read that letter now. This is a very important letter. He says, uh, Nehru wrote something in the... In the uh, Patrika, this is a news, news, newspaper in Allahabad in um, 1952. And he says, uh, your, your uh, article uh, entitled, Let Us Be True to One Another, published in the A.B. Patrika, Allahabad edition, December 30th, 1951 attracted my attention, and I read it over and over again. This article contains the nucleus of future activities of the human society in the spiritual realm, and I have read in your statement about your deep thought on the onward march of human civilization. You have rightly said the following words in this connection, that is, so we search for new ways new aspects of the truth, more in harmony with our environment. And we question each other and debate and quarrel and evolve any number of isms and philosophies. As in the days of Socrates, we live in an age of questioning, but the questioning is not confined to a city like Athens. It is worldwide. End of quote. Prabhupada now says, there are two ways of answering such questions. I mean, the deductive way and the inductive way. Mortality of man is established by either of the above ways. In, deduct in, other, words, in other words, see, he just said something really shocking. Mortality of man, that means death, is established by either of the above ways. It's a, it's a very shocking statement he made right there. Let's see what he says. Man is mortal. No, no. In deductive way, we may take it for granted from reliable source. Man is mortal. 
But in the inductive way, we may approach the same truth by our poor reasoning of observation and experiment. By observation, we can see that Gandhi dies, Fotilal dies, Siar Das dies, Patel dies. These were all leaders of the uh, independence movement from India. They were all great personalities in Indian modern history. Patel dies, and therefore we conclude that man dies, or man is mortal. Then again, in the same deductive way, we may reason that man is mortal and find that Jawaharlal is a man. In other words, you, Nehru, are a man, just like the others. And thus conclude that Jawaharlal is mortal. Yeah, you're all going to die, buddy. Right? You're also going to die. Truth means absolute truth. So there now, now is now is criticizing Nehru because he just said new aspects of truth in harmony with our environment. That's a nonsense statement because truth, Prabhupada says, is absolute truth. Relative truth is conditional, and when the conditions fail, the relative truth disappears. So Prabhupada just defeated Nehru's whole thesis. He says, relative truth disappears when the conditions, uh, because relative truth is conditional, and when the conditions fail, relative truth disappears. But absolute truth does not exist on conditions. It is above all conditions, conditions of the material world. So when we speak of truth, we may take it for the absolute truth. And when we speak of approaching the truth by new ways, we may take it for granted that what we want to approach the truth, that what we want to approach the truth by the inductive method, but what we want is to approach the truth by the deductive method. So he's saying, what you're talking about in your article is complete gibberish nonsense. But he said it in a very nice way. <laughs> He said, you're just dealing with relative truth, but truth means the absolute truth because relative truth is conditional. And when the conditionals disappear, the relative truth disappears. So it has no reality for spiritual people. Well, it's temporary reality, but it's not permanent. And when we speak of approaching the truth by new ways, we may take it for granted that what we want is to approach the truth by the inductive method, the way. Absolute truth is described in the Vedas as satyam param dimahi, the sumam bonum. So this satyam param dimahi is in the Bhagavatam. I think it's the first uh, verse of it. Uh, yeah. It says, Janmadasya yato nivyadi taratas jarte swa vigya soa tene brahma hirdaya adikavaye muyanti at suraya dejavari madam yatabini mayo yatachi sargo misha dana sena sada mirasta kuakam satyam param dimahi. There it is, first verse of Bhagavad Gita. So he says, The sumum bonum, that means that it's a Latin term for the topmost best thing. And in this case, the topmost best truth. And from this absolute truth, everything emanates. Janmadasya yata. The absolute truth is described in the Vedic literatures as sanatana, or eternal. And the philosophy or science which deals with such eternal subjects is described as sanatana dharma. So here, in a short paragraph, it completely decimated destroyed, stamped out, threw out the window, Nehru's entire uh, presumption in his so-called big article in the Patrika. Only a pure devotee can do this. With one short sentence or a paragraph, he can destroy legions of books written by speculators. The big tomes that are in the libraries, he destroys it at once. He shows that it's a waste of paper. Yeah. And the paper is not worth 
more than using it for toilet paper. Therefore, we have first to find out the eternal absolute truth by some new ways, question mark. And then we have to find out the new aspects of absolute truth in harmony with our present environment. So this is a rhetorical question. He's making, you know, he's ridiculing him. The present environment is undoubtedly different from the old. And if we compare the present with the old, we can very easily discover that one, people in the present age are generally short living, the average duration of life being 30 years or so. Now you might say, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. It, it says in, in uh, the uh, CDC says the average life expectancy is 80 years. Uh, but wait a minute, that doesn't take into account the overdoses, the accidents, the murders, and so forth. So if you take all that into account, the 80 years will come down drastically, see? So that's why it says statistics don't lie, but the people that make the statistics do lie, see? So it depends what are your so-called parameters of the statistics that counts. Two, they are generally not very simple. Almost every man is designing and crooked. Three, they have no scope for high thinking because they are pre perplexed with different relative truths, like you, Nehru. He doesn't say that, but it, you can see it in, in invisible ink, right? Four, unfortunate as they are in this age, their problems remain unsolved for the whole life, even though they are tackled by their leaders. In other words, the leaders he uses a football term here. When you tackle someone, you know, you tackle the guy with the ball, right? So he's saying the leaders are tackled. Therefore, he says that the problems remain unsolved for the whole life of the people, even though they are tackled by the leaders. Yeah, they have a five-year plan, they have a 10-year plan, they have a 20-year plan, and every one of the plans fails. Then you have a new presidential election and people say, oh, this guy's a nonsense, I'm gonna vote for the new guy. And the new guy is also a nonsense. So the problems never go away, they just keep getting worse and worse and compounded. See? They make the best effort to solve a problem, but unfortunately, the same becomes more acute and stringent. Now those problems just get worse and worse. And above all, the people in this age are always distressed by famine, scarcity, grievances, and diseases in an increasing ratio. In other words, it's getting worse and worse. In the old days, life was not so much conditional and encumbered. The simple problems were then the problems of bread, clothing, and shelter, which were solved by the simplest process. By agriculture, they used to solve the bread, clothing and shelter problems, and industrialization was unknown to them. Thus, they had no idea of living in big palatial buildings at the cost of sacrificing the boon of humanity. In other words, a few people live in these big palaces, and most of the people are struggling just to make a living and living check to check. You know what I'm talking about? Huh? You know what I'm talking about? You can't even afford a mortgage. You're just living check to check. But yet, Bezos and this one and that one, they don't have one house, and that house is already a, pal already a palace. They have 20 houses that are all palaces in different places, and cars, and this and that, and and this food and that food and this uh, monkey gland transplant and this thing and that thing, see? Because they have money, way too much money. They don't even know what to do with it. They were satisfied to live in the cottages and yet they were perfectly intelligent. Even the famous Chanakya Pandit, who was the prime minister of India during the reign of Chandra Gupta, used to live in a cottage and draw no salary from the state. 
Such simple habits did not deteriorate his high intelligence and dignity, and as such, he had compiled many useful literatures which are still read by millions for social and political guidance. Thus, the simplicity of Brahminical culture was an ideal to the subordinate others of society, and in a deductive way, the subordinate orders, namely the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, and the Sudras, would follow the instructions of the cultured Brahmin. Such ways of approaching the truth is always simple, plain, and perhaps the most perfect. Yes. How do you solve a mathematical problem? Well, according to the mathematical process, you break it down into simple little, little parts. And then you deal with those simple little parts, and then you build it up again to solve the problem. So if you don't do that, if you try and solve the problem with all its complex uh, parts, you'll fail. Okay, so he's saying that the way of the Brahminical way of, of approaching the truth is always simple, plain, and most perfect. So, simple, plain, and most perfect. Chant Hare Krishna. Follow the regulative principles. Associate with good devotees. Engage always in devotional service you will go back to Godhead. You'll be the highest, most intelligent scientist, philosopher, and the best person, and a pure devotee. That's the solution. That's the real purpose of education. That's the real solution to all problems of life. Simple, plain, and most perfect. Chant Hare Krishna without committing the offenses against the Holy Name and be perfect. <clears throat> The cultured Brahmin order of the society would declare that there is God or Brahman and the Chetras, Vaishas, and Sudras who are less cultured than the Brahmins would follow the latter faithfully. Call it blindly or otherwise. Yeah, people say, oh, you have blind faith. That's better than your nonsense faith or no faith. Better to have blind faith than no faith, right? By such faithfully following, the subordinate classes would be able to save much time in the matter of arguing or reasoning for the existence of God at all. And still they would not be faithless. In other words, if you put faith in the statements of Krishna and the Acharyas, you, you save a lot of time. And you don't waste it arguing. Look at how much people are arguing today. Oh, Trump is bad. Oh, Biden is this. Biden, they're just arguing, right? Oh, capitalism is bad. Communism is the right thing. You know, we got to break capitalism. You know, they're arguing all the time. You know? Oh, black lives matter. Oh, all lives matter. Oh, no lives matter. They're arguing, right? <laughs> Everybody's arguing. And it's all a waste of time. It's not helping anyone advance in, in life. It's all a waste of time. In the old days, even a politician, Brahmin, like Chanakya Pandit, would say that Vidvatam cha nipatam cha daivatulya kadachana swadesh pujyate raja vidwar sabartra pujyato. A really cultured, learned fellow is far above a politician because a politician is honored by the votes of his countrymen, while a cultured and learned fellow is honored everywhere all over the world. So that's, that's a translation of that verse. See? And Chanakya Pandit was a, in this, he was a Brahmin, but he gave political advice. And because of that, Chandragupta was able to defeat uh, Iskandar. You know what that means, Iskandar? No, Alexander the Great, when we were studying, huh? Hindi, Iskandar is the Hindi translation of, of uh, Sikandar. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you say Iskandar also. I, I, there was an Armenian guy I knew, his name was Iskandar, uh, Bolobyan. 
you know. <laughs> so, but you can pronounce it a little bit different in different languages, but uh, Sekandar is the way you say it in Hindi. We used to call him Alexander the Grape. <laughs> Alexander the Grape means something big. Alexander the Grape means something very small, right? Yeah. And if you read history, actually, he was a failure. He did not invade India. All he did was cross the border a little bit, and he got defeated. And that's because of Chanakya Pandit's advice. A really, cult okay, a really cultured fellow is far above a politician because a politician is honored by the votes of his countrymen, while a cult cultured and learned fellow is honored everywhere all over the world. So we say that Rabindranath and Gandhi were never dependent for the votes of their countrymen, but they were honored all over the world for their cultural contribution. The same Chanakya Pandit defined the standard of learning. The standard of learning had had to be testified by its result and not by the manner of university degrees. Ah, Falena Parichete, judge from the result, not by the degree. Like you can go into the doctor's office or the dentist's office and you'll see right away in the entrance, his plaques, graduate of Harvard Dental uh, University, right? Kumba, what do you say? Uh, Come the Lord something with the honors, right? And then he sits you down on a chair and he starts drilling. You're dying of pain, right? And you say, this guy got a PhD in dentistry? I could have done better going to the mechanic. <laughs> and after your bridge fails and all the uh, dental implants fail, you say, you know, I spent $60,000 and after seven years, the whole thing fell out of my mouth. You see? Yeah, this is a strategy, tragedy. Just like um, there's this lady that was called uh, Joan Winters. You know who she is? She's a comedian. She's a nonsense lady. So she's one of these ladies, you know, that, you know, goes time and time again to the plastic surgeon and to the dentist and to this one and that one to, you know, artificially make her look like a young movie star, although she's 80 years old, right? So she went in for an adjustment to something. It might have been her teeth or her, her uh, plastic surgery or something. And she died. The doctor made a mistake and she died. She didn't know she was going to die. You see? So, you know, how much can you play around with the body? Right? The body, see, if you have a car, let's say it's a 1940 Ford, right? You can keep replacing the parts and keep the car moving. But if you have a body, you can only replace the parts a few times and you're going to die. You're not going to live longer than you're destined to live. You're not going to live forever by replacing your heart, by replacing your lungs, by replacing your face. Now they have face transplants, right? And replacing your brain. You're not, it's not going to work indefinitely. You're still going to die. People think it's going to work. You know, there'll be, a, you know, what do you call a... a the, uh, uh, the the parts company for the human body. You know, you go in, and you get, you buy a new heart, you buy a new face, you buy a new leg, you buy a new tooth. You know, it's not going to last forever. Okay. So the same Chanakya Pandit defined the standard of learning. The standard of learning had to be testified by its result and not by the manner of university degrees. He said that one who looks upon all women except one's married wife as mothers, all others' wealth as the pebbles on the street, and all living beings as one's own self is really a learned fellow. So this is the criterion. You look upon all women, or if you're a woman, you look upon all men as your mother or your father. You look upon others' wealth as pebbles in the street, and you treat everyone else as you would want to be treated, the golden rule. So the golden rule was there way before the Bible. <clears throat> so then it says, he never stressed on the point of standard of how many grammars, how many rhetorics, 
or other books of knowledge one might have gone through, or how many doctorates of different universities one might have been decorated with. At the present moment, we know very well that a few men look upon other women, besides one's married wife, as mothers. Very few men will look upon others' wealth as pebbles on the street, and very few men will try to behave with other living beings as one wants to be treated oneself. So it's in other words, he's saying there are very few people that actually follow this advice on how to be a cultured, educated person. This is a theory of education, right? In other words, you're not educated because you have different degrees from different universities and you've written so many books and this and that. You're educated if you look upon all women or women look upon all men as mother or father. You're really educated if you look upon others' wealth like pebbles in the street and you're really educated if you uh, behave with others as you would like them to behave with you. Okay? The sages of old age discovered it by spiritual culture that man's energy should be utilized only for spiritual realization. Not to speak of Lord Sri Krishna who spoke the philosophy of Bhagavad Gita near about 5,000 years ago. We know that within 2,000 years of human history, no sages, including Jesus Christ, Prophet Muhammad, Lord Buddha, Acharya Shankara, Madhya, Ramanuja, or even Lord Chaitanya gave any importance to, material, to the materialistic way of living. None of them gave any importance to it. Material necessities were always subordinate to the spiritual realization. They saw it that the bread problem, clothing problem, and shelter problem are never solved by material activities because in the law of nature, the elephant is given the whole jungle to eat and the little ant is given a grain of sugar to solve their respective bread problems and yet the animals remain hungry. It is not the question of a jungle or a grain of sugar that can solve our bread problem, but it is the question of real food that can quench the hunger of human being and revitalize him to proper life. In other words, the real bread is spiritual knowledge and simple living, high thinking. It is not the question of a jungle or a grain of sugar. Human being, therefore, should not be encouraged to satisfy his unsatiated hunger like the giant elephant. So the giant elephant has the whole forest to eat in, but yet he remains hungry because it's unsatiated. Or the little ant, but he should be trained up otherwise, which shall provide for his real food. Just like Arjuna says, Krishna, your real prasadam, your best prasadam, is the knowledge that you have given me. That's your best prasadam. Yeah. And, and he says that, yeah, nasti mohas tat prasadat mayuchata. This is your best prasadam, O Achuta, Krishna. This is, you have cleared away all my illusions by this transcendental knowledge. Human being, therefore, should not be encouraged to satisfy his unsatiated hunger like the giant elephant or the little ant, but he should be trained up otherwise, which shall provide for his real food. The wonderful temples, the mosques, and the cathedrals of past centuries were built up to give them, meaning the people in general, the real food, and were not built up by blind or unquestioning faith. They were built up on full faith and reasoning, which were based on the deductive process. The Vedas, the Bible, or the Quran would ask the human being to make proper use of his conserved energy in the transcendental service of God, and unsophisticated men in the old days would follow such instruction unhesitatingly for realizing the absolute truth. Unhesitatingly, they would follow. Such temples, mosques, were therefore centers of high culture to provide real food to human consciousness. 
But in the present age, in the absence of such high culture, there is hardly any difference between the temples, mosques, and, and cathedrals, and the high commercial buildings in the busy cities. In other words, he's saying, today, most, if not all, temples, mosques, and cathedrals have been transformed into high-rise business offices and factory projects for making money, not for helping people go back to Godhead. That's why in Christianity you have what's called prosperity theology. You know what it is, prosperity theology? You don't know? <laughs> well, there's, there's this famous preacher in Texas, Mr. Austin. He preaches that God wants you to be rich. And he says, the way you go rich is you by tithing the, the, the church. That means you have to give a certain percentage of your money to the church every month. So Mr. Austin gets really rich. And the other people have the hope of getting rich. You see, they're very clever. Yeah, what happened? And what happened? Okay. That's the same guy? Austin, yeah. <laughs> but in the absence of such high culture, there's hardly any difference between the temples, mosques, and cathedrals and the high commercial buildings in a busy city. If the culture is to be revived, it is quite possible to do it even in your parliamentary buildings in New Delhi or in the commercial buildings of New York as the Socratesian ways of reasoning is not bound up within the walls of Athens, so also the Brahminical culture is not bound up within the walls of India. Well, if you listen to a fanatic Hindu, you think it is. I say, just like one time I did a puja in this one Nepali Hindu man's house in, the, in Seattle. And after the puja, one uh, Nepali Hindu came up to me and said, huh, he said, you did uh, pretty well. I said, well, thank you. He said, but what you did is not bona fide. I said, really? He said, no. I said, why not? He said, because you're not born in India in a Brahmin family. <laughs> he told me right to my face. He, he, not, you know, he was not holding back. I said, well, that's not what my spiritual master told him. He said, then your spiritual master misled you. I said, well, I think you're making a mistake. In fact, I don't think. I know you're making a mistake. But uh, you're, you're free to have your opinion. And we'll see later on in life who's right and who's wrong. Right? Falena Parichite, you judge from the result. So yesterday, one lady told me, a Hindu lady that I've known for many years. I met her early on when I came to Seattle. And... Uh, and she's never supported our temple, although she's a wealthy lady. Never supported our temple. But we've always been friends. And, and at least once a year, she comes to the temple, like on Jan Masi, like she did yesterday. And yesterday, she's, <laughs> she wouldn't stop. She said, Prabhu, you have done more for our Indian community than anyone else in Seattle. And she didn't stop. She kept to us. Like, I said, that's enough. I said, you don't have to say anymore. But... Uh, I mean, she just insisted on on speaking like that. And I did give her that uh, donation sheet. Let's see if she <laughs> donates something. Anyway, Felina, Felina Parichita, you judge from the result. You don't judge by the, uh, the, the uh, different uh, uh, documents of uh, you know graduation from this college or this degree or that you judge from the actual result. As the Socratesian ways of reasoning is not bound up within the walls of Athens, so also the Brahminical culture is not bound up within the walls of India. You can find out the nine prescribed qualifications of a Brahmin, the seven qualifications of a Chatriya, and the three qualifications of Vaishya, and one qualification of Sudra worldwide. You can therefore pick up Brahmins and other orders of society all over the world. Gandhiji, although born in a Vaishya family, 
possessed almost all the nine qualifications of a Brahmana. He said almost. And if possible, we can find out such Brahman in other parts of the world. So the Bengali guy's statement to me was nonsense. See? Prabhupada went all over the world and he made devotees and he made Brahmins. So this is nonsense. One Brahmin Gandhi congressman is quite competent to guide its, its principal, whereas a thousand other Sudra congressmen, congressmen can only help it help it to break up into pieces. In other words, he's saying, look, you need one real Brahmana and hopefully Vaishnava congressman, and he'll straighten out the whole problem of India. But if you have a whole bunch of, of uh, non-Brahmana politicians, they'll just break the Vedic culture. They won't build it up. They'll break the whole thing down. Thus, if we want to approach the absolute truth by new ways in harmony with present environment, we should try to be true to one another in the qualified way of Brahminical culture. Only a dozen of real qualified Brahmins from all parts of the world should combine to guide the principles of the Chatriyas, the Vaishas, and the Sudras all over the world. The Socratesian way of reasoning should be fully utilized because that makes the only difference between a human being and a beast. That means Socrates would always ask questions. Do you know this? Do you know that? Can you explain this to me? And when the person faltered, he said, well, I don't know either. So therefore, we should continue questioning together and find the truth. See, if a person says, oh, I know the answer. I know the answer. Yeah, The answer is economic development. We have to have more uh, mutual trade agreements with America and uh, Russia, and then that'll solve the problem of India. No, that's a bunch of nonsense. It hasn't solved any problem. It's just made it worse. <laughs> you have so many, uh, what do you call this, uh, mutual trade agreements in India, right? You have... Uh, Toyota in India, you have Hyundai in India, you have uh, Microsoft in India. Has it solved any problems? No, problems are still there. You know, COVID is there. The Chinese solved all those problems. <laughs> They're forcing you to go back to a more simpler way of life. We should thank the Chinese for COVID. <clears throat> there is ample scope for this new way of approaching absolute truth, and that will only solve the acute distressing world problem. If there's a scarcity of such qualified Brahmanas, which I honestly think there is, we should combine to evolve such Brahminical culture, not by blind faith, but by sound reasoning and questioning. But all the same, we must be sincere and thorough in our attempt. As a humble disciple of Om Vishnu Pad, Sri Srimad Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami, I wish to remain always true to you and everyone, and if you sincerely be true to your forefather, meaning Gandhi, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, to your forefathers, that means uh, the ancient Indian culture, the Brahminical culture, I mean the Brahminical culture, you have the strength and capacity to save the world by presenting the Brahminical culture once again for consummation of the dis distressed world. In such acts, of your broad-mindedness, a broadness of mind, I am always at your service, awaiting your reply with interest. Yours sincerely, Bhakti Vedanta Swami, uh, Abhay Charan Bhakti Vedanta Swami. Well, obviously Nehru didn't answer him. By the way, Prabhupada knew Nehru personally. He used to come to his uh, pharmacy, right? But he was only interested, Prabhupada, he was only interested in Western medicine. <laughs> that was Nehru's thing, you know. He was like worshiping the West, you know. He didn't like Indian stuff. He wasn't even a Hindu. He wasn't even really a Hindu. You know? Okay. Are there any questions? So this is an amazing letter by Srila Prabhupada. Okay. So we covered a lot of things today. A lot of different points. I think I'll cover one more thing. That's uh, amazing. This is a letter that Prabhupada wrote to Hansa Dutta Prabhu. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Let's see here. Where is that letter? Okay, I'm not finding it. Okay, well, anyway, then I'm, I'm, the one I'm looking for, I'm not finding. So there's something else here. He says to Giriraj Prabhu uh, Sw Swami in 25th February 1976, it is my intelligence and your cooperation that is working. There's a story of a man who was challenged whether he had any intelligence. He then began to look in his pocket he replied, if there is money, then there is intelligence. So you have gone so far to collect money and intelligently. But if there is no money, where is the intelligence? Both must combine, then everything works out nicely. So yesterday, both combined, and hopefully today also, and tomorrow, and for up until the end of the year. He says... There's a story, a man was challenged whether he had intelligence. What did he do? He started looking in his pocket. And he said, if there is money, there is intelligence. So this is very important. Just like our class this morning, we discussed something very important. In the class, in the purport to the class this morning, Prabhupada said, the lesson is therefore that no one should be puffed up for his powers borrowed from the Lord. The sane man should rather feel obliged to the Lord for such benefactions and must utilize such power for the service of the Lord. Such power can be withdrawn at any time by the Lord, so the best use of such power and opulence is to engage them in the service of the Lord. In other words, if you have some intellectual uh, power or if you have some physical power, or if you have some uh, monetary power, it should be used in the service of Krishna and not otherwise. He, Prabhupada says, uh, because it can be withdrawn, it can be taken away at any time. So while you have those assets, they should, you should use them right away in the service of Krishna and not hesitate. If endowment of powers and withdrawal of powers if endowment of powers and withdrawal withdrawal of powers by the Lord are possible, even for the great devotee like Arjuna or even the demigods in heaven, then what to speak of the ordinary living beings who are but figs compared to such great souls? The lesson is therefore that no one should be puffed up by his powers borrowed from the Lord. The sane man should rather feel obliged to the Lord for such benedictions and must utilize such power for the service of the Lord. Such power can be withdrawn at any time by the Lord. So the best use of such power and opulence is to engage them in the service of the Lord. Hari bol, so engage your powers in Krishna's service. Now, not, oh, well, I'll wait till I get older, or I'll wait till I'm a millionaire, or I'll wait till, uh, you know, the end of time. No. And lastly, Prabhupada says in a letter to Srinath Das Kana, if the Lord gives us some inconvenience, then we, and he says, it is too bad that you are suffering too much. However, this may be taken as the mercy of the Lord. If the Lord gives us some inconvenience, then we may take it that he has reduced 
our actual punishment and just given us a token of punishment. So you remain fixed up at the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna, and by always thinking of him and trying to render some little service to him, everything will come out all right. It is nice that you are chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and reading Bhagavad Gita as it is. Continue that and Krishna will surely give you protection as he states, Konteya Pratijanihi Name Bhakta Pranasyati. I hope this meets you well. Your ever worship, ever well wisher, AC Bhakti Vedanta Swami. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay, I'm going to try one more time to find this letter to Hansa Duda because it's a very important letter. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Rama, 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 Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Nineteen sixty-eight. It's got to be here. Okay, so I think we will have Guru Puja now. Trishila Prabhupada. Okay, I didn't find it. Let's just see if I can one more time. <clears throat> 